All right, everybody. Thanks so much for coming out to the January 19, 2022 Skeptics in the Pub uh, for very virtual values of pub meeting of Triangle Skeptics. Our speaker tonight is a great get, Rob Palmer, aka the well-known skeptic. Rob is going to regale us with a talk that I think I saw in uh, one of its first incarnations at CSICon 2018. Um, entitled Belief in Psychics, Where's the Harm? Mm, Rob, what's, the, I, what's the harm? What's the harm? And, and, and by I, the way, I knew I'd get it wrong. You saw a an amazingly rushed 10 or 12 minute, if I recall right, version of this. And, and I'm gonna I'm gonna make you listen to an hour of it. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. yeah. I, I was in the Sunday papers, and that's all the time you got. It was right. like well, you, you've identified my kink. Crazy. It's hour long talks. So I will go ahead and uh, kick this on over to Rob without any further ado. Uh, thanks, everybody, again, and uh, enjoy the talk. OK, so if anyone uh, notices any glitches in my audio, uh, sometimes that means like the internet connection on my end isn't that good. So just let me know, and I'll shut my video off, because you don't need to see my face talking um, if it's causing problems, especially. So OK, so I need the ability to share my screen. Do I have that? I think I do. I think I do. Okay. So let's go to that. Okay. So can you see my screen? Affirmative. And is there anything yeah. obstructing yes. it? Because like I have gray bars on it for uh, the video panels and stuff. Is it clear for you guys? Yes. Uh, it's clear. Okay, that's good news. I am going to hide the video panel because I can't read some of the stuff I'm going to have to read. And also, there should be some sound here, so let's see. So, um, yes, yeah, so as we know, the topic is um, psychics are real, how we know their claims are true. Uh, no, uh, this is some psychic with telekinesis screwed me up, but uh, they're always trying to mess things up. But I'm going to fix that with actual tech magic. So the real subject is belief in psychics, what's the harm? Um, I want a world where the purported psychics no longer act as parasites on the grief stricken or mislead time sensitive investigations. So that was kind of an audio check. Did everybody hear that? Yes. Okay. okay. Points, you, uh, you put this in the chat, I guess, um, if, the, if the audio is generally disabled. But who you who you thought that was? I'll play it again just in case. You I want a world where the purported psychics no longer act as parasites on the grief stricken or mislead time sensitive investigations. Yeah, so I just came across that uh, by random accident while I was watching a debate on YouTube, and I had to put that in as a little audio uh, to check. So uh, yeah, let me say that the views and opinions expressed in this presentation may not necessarily represent those of anyone else at Triangle Skeptics, but they should. <laughs> presentation outline. Uh, I'm going to talk about my background just quickly, why this topic is important, and what is the harm, uh, how I got involved. And then we're going to talk about, well, they can't all be faking it, can they? Uh, what's the size of the psychic industry, and who's to blame for the widespread belief in this, and what's being done or attempting to be done? So my background is five years, six years ago, I joined GSOW and became a skeptical activist. Gorilla Skeptics on Wikipedia, that is, for people who don't know. It's an organization that adds science and fights pseudoscience and paranormal claims and conspiracy theories on the world's number one source of information, Wikipedia, and several other people in this group who are members. I won't, I won't out people, but they are. In 2018, I was hired as a columnist by Skeptical Inquirer, uh, and now I work with people who investigate and counter paranormal, pseudoscientific, and uh, conspiracy claims. And that's really neat. So I've done presentations at international conferences on skepticism and psychic fraud, including, oh, I didn't update that. DragonCon 2021 happened a few months ago. So I did that. And I am part of the skeptical movement that educates people about subjects such as this. So this presentation was partly created for uh, groups uh, which didn't necessarily know about skeptical activism. So there's a little bit of information that you guys should all be familiar with, but I'm gonna go through it quickly anyway. What's the skeptical movement? There's a nice article on Wikipedia. Even skeptics aren't aware of this. It describes it, its history, who its movers and shakers are. Um, and Carl Sagan famously said, 
Science is a way of thinking, a way of skeptically interrogating the universe with a fine understanding of human fallibility. And that's a very important point, understanding human fallibility, right? And he also said, if we're not able to ask skeptical questions, to interrogate those who tell us something is true, and to be skeptical of those in authority, then we're up for grabs for the next charlatan, political or religious, who comes ambling along. And that was his final interview. Um, so generally for me, it is far better to grasp the universe as it really is than to persist in delusion, however satisfying and reassuring. I kind of love that from Carl Sagan. And that's hard for some people to accept, to want to believe in, uh, you know, in pseudoscience and paranormal claims. And Daniel Waxton said, scientific skepticism is the practice of studying paranormal and pseudoscientific claims through the lens of science and critical scholarship and then sharing the results with the public. That's kind of an important part. And that's one of the things we try to do on GSOW. So why is learning about the danger and believing in psychics especially important for people who are raised in a mainstream religion? So again, that was thrown in because I gave this talk to people who are humanists and that sort of thing. And they had generally previously been religious. So that's an important point. A lot of people come out of a religion and they fall for this kind of paranormal stuff. Uh, and Dr. Stephen Novella, famously of the Skeptics Guide to the Universe said, I think that when you're raised to believe in life after death, angels, demons, ghosts, and other such religious pseudoscience, then paying someone to speak to the dead and get messages back isn't much of a leap. And I, and I just find that is extremely true. Now, Bob Nygaard, who you'll be hearing a little bit more about in this presentation, he's a psychic fraud investigator. He said, I've never come across a case where an atheist got taken by a psychic. Uh, I never had a case like that. And he wasn't saying it can possibly happen, but he, he has worked in this industry for well over a decade. So this is, this is a couple of screens here of people who are deep into the woo, woo world. And this is the kind of stuff they promote, right? This is James Van Prague, a psychic medium. And every time I say that, by the way, picture air quotes around it, so I'll keep doing that. I think another generation, 50s, 60s, people went into religion and they were really involved with the religion. I found that religion doesn't answer the certain unique questions people have about faith and belief. So of course, James Van Prague can. Uh, because our consciousness doesn't die at death, that's a claim. We carry our mindset of thoughts and beliefs with us to the other side, another claim, as in life, so in death, when we cross over into the other dimensions, we continue to create experiences through our thoughts the same way we did in life. All claims without any backing from James Van Praag. So the importance of religion can be showed here. This was a Pew Research poll from 2018, and it shows that approximately 41% of all adults uh, believed in psychics at that point. Right, and they broke it up into all the Christian, main, mainstream Christian denominations. Don't know why they didn't tackle other religions, but so, you know, it ranged from 46 for Catholic, interestingly, evangelicals were the low, low end of that, but average 41 or so for all um, Americans. And interesting, if you claim nothing in particular, it was even higher than the average and certainly of the religious average. And the only thing that would partially inoculate you is being an affirmed atheist. And even that, it surprises me. So one out of 10 atheists still said they believe in psychics. So what is the harm in that belief? So now we're gonna go through some actual newsworthy cases of people who, because they have this kinds of belief, were you know, paid a huge price. In December, 2019, this was a Massachusetts psychic, um, she was arrested for stealing more than $70,000 from a client, right? She told a client that her daughter is possessed by a demon. And there we go, a religious thing again. And she would need to purchase her daughter's soul back, right? And she claimed she could relocate her into a Barbie doll. Bridget Evans, another psychic, convinced victims that their money and valuables contained evil spirits. This is a common claim. Right, so for people who believe in the paranormal and spirituality, evil spirits are a thing. So you're, you are in possession of things that have evil spirits and they must be purged. So you know, she would take the money and take the items and you know, get rid of those evil spirits. Uh, Bridget Evans uh, was sentenced to five years of probation. Right, not, not a sentence, five years of probation. And she took a plea, plea deal and then 37 months in prison for fraud again. And this is a, a common problem. These people get arrested. They don't get a real sentence. They get back on the street and they immediately do the same thing to someone else, multiple people. 
Uh, she was recently again charged with fraud for a third time. And this time she had taken almost a half a million dollars from two victims. Another psychic, Priscilla DeMauro, she convinced her clients that a client who was, who was a guy, so he and a woman named Michelle, she used this poetry where twin flames kept apart by negativity that made to the newspapers. Um, this client paid her hundreds of thousands of dollars over many, many years. This is another common thing. A lot of these go on for a very long time. It's not one visit and money is taken until Michelle died. And then the scam didn't stop because Priscilla DeMauro said she could reincarnate Michelle's soul into another body for her client. $700,000 was a total loss in this case. So she took a plea bargain with a sentence of less than a year and was not required to pay restitution. Also a very common thing. You cannot trust the legal system if you get screwed this way. So don't get screwed this way. Sherry Ioannowicz, um, she said a witch had placed a curse on her client's entire family, right? And of course, only she could prevent them all from coming to harm. So this was a Brazilian medical student in the US and a seven year scam where she paid Ioannowicz from money from many sources her inheritance, um, her own bank account. She borrowed money from family. She even quit med school and became a stripper to make more, more money to pay Ioannowicz, $1.6 million. In September, 2019, she was sentenced to 40 months and ordered to pay restitution, a rare outcome. Now, the issue is, does Ioannowicz have the $1.6 million in the bank to pay back? Not likely, over seven years, you know, given to friends and family, stashed in places that can't be reached by the government. So that's often what happens too. Uh, even when restitution is ordered by the court, none or very little of it ever gets paid back. Jean Marie Marks, this went on for a long time, which is why I'm gonna talk about it. In 2010, she was tried for defrauding people out of $500,000, 18 months in prison, forced to pay some restitution. She was out on the streets, arrested again, convicted this time for uh, over 300,000 for five victims over three years, sentenced to six years in prison in order to pay restitution. So this went on and on. And actually in 2018, CBS Network aired an episode of the true crime series, dramatizing her criminal activities. And it starred the detective I mentioned earlier, Bob Nygar. It was called Pink Collar Crimes was the name of that episode. Uh, what was the name of the series? And it's really worth it to check out if you could stream his episode. So he wound up actually playing himself they tried to hire somebody <laughs> and, and they figured no one could play Bob Nygaard, the detective with a New York accent like Bob Nygaard could. And then there was another series on a different network uh, called The Con. This was more recent. And uh, this was another, uh, there were episode called The Psychic Con. And in this case, Bob uh, was interviewed as well as him showing the stories of some of the big cases that he busted. So who are these victims? Are they just stupid people? You know, just, just people who have had no education? Not necessarily. This is a quote from Bob, from his you know, uh, vast experience with clients, with the victims of these uh, con artists. Does it matter if you're a college professor, if you're a lawyer, if you're a medical doctor? You're on their territory and they know how to take advantage of that. So what's the magnitude of this problem? You know, just a few stupid people? Well. In over just one decade, Bob Nygaard obtained convictions in 40 cases and recovered over 4 million for his clients. So that's the money he got back, but that's a, you know, a small part of the money that was actually probably never retrievable. So some individual losses are relatively small, though perhaps not to the victim, $10,000, but some are huge by anyone's standards, right? As I showed you, in some cases, it's even millions of dollars. And most losses are never recovered, and some are never even reported to the authorities. So, you know, why, why would that happen? Well, you know, Bob told me a story, um, which maybe I'll get to later about that, but it was heartbreaking. So these cases are all psychological manipulation under the guise of assistance, and these people sell false hope. And it's a very powerful product when you're a person that is absolutely desperate, right? Um, this is a fallacy we may not, we may know as skeptics, some cost fallacy, right? If I stopped now, I would have had to admit that I, all the money I put in was wasted. And so I felt if I just kept going, that maybe it would just all come true. That's what Bob Nygaard said, some of his clients say. So yeah, as I mentioned, so, some people don't even report the crime. Why would that be? You know, because they face financial wreckage 
but some people call him and they just want to tell him what happened. They don't want to go forward because they're too embarrassed. They don't want to see their name in the papers. He told me the story of a college professor who had lost, I think it was upwards of a quarter of a million dollars over many years. And when he realized he was being conned, he said, I can't have my name in the papers and I will, won't be able to go back and work at my university. I'll be a laughing stock. So he just let it go. So people ask, well, how, how is this possible? What's wrong with the legal system? What about justice? So, you know, isn't there a law against this? Well, every jurisdiction in different countries and in the US, different states, municipalities have different rules. It turns out New York state has a law where this sort of thing, any psychic reading, not a, just a big con, you go in and you get crystal ball reading, it's punishable by 90 days in jail. Yet in Manhattan, you know, there's fortune tellers on every street corner. So it's just ignored. It's called a victimless crime. Um, and so victims can't rely on the legal system for justice, right? At every single step, there's a problem. Filing a complaint, you might walk into a precinct and they'll laugh at you, oh, no one had a gun to your head. That's not a crime. Uh, you know, getting to, to go through with that, making an arrest. If the person is arrest, have, having the person, uh, you know, in charge of that part, part of the legal system actually want to prosecute the case because there's little chance they're gonna get enough evidence or get a jury. Uh, to convict them and then if it goes forward you know is the jury going to convict them or are they going to say no it was your fault so nigar gets five or so requests for help daily and, and many victims of course don't even seek justice as i mentioned due to shame uh, in a lot of cases there's insufficient evidence of fraud which is what's needed to bring a case so most perpetrators are never arrested or prosecuted and those that are often get a slap on the wrist and continue to apply their trade and take advantage of other people so another psychic was Anne Thompson. Uh, she claimed she needed to use money and various items to perform rituals to vanquish again spirits and demons and curses, play, plagues on a family. So this was a big deal because it was uh, 20 clients out of a million dollars over five years, right? She took a plea deal to serve five years probation and to return just a fraction of the stolen money. And I bring this case up because it was very recent when I first did this presentation, especially. Uh, it, it was, it was uh, j had just come out. So this is June, 2021, right? So the victims, after hearing the sentence, said crime pays. Um, and uh, both got five years probation in order to repay the victims a portion of what they stole. And they said that the, uh, the psychic, Ann Thompson, bragged to me that she should have been a lawyer or a judge. She knew how to game the system. Also, uh, this was from one of the victims. She convinced that my son was being tormented by an evil spirit that was causing all the relationship problems we were experiencing. And uh, the Manhattan uh, DA, uh, Cy Vance Jr., uh, you know, this, this light sentence was called a travesty of justice. And people were saying, you know, here's what I've learned, crime pays. Um, and then, of course, <laughs> To, uh, to, to, to maybe get a better sentence or whatever, you know, the psychic actually admitted, oh, she didn't have psychic powers, duh. So why am I talking about this? How did I become interested in, in this topic? Um, I was driving home, listening to one of my favorite podcasts at the time, Skepticality, and they were interviewing a psychic detective called Bob Nygaard. Um, that's where I first heard of the gentleman. And because I was in GSOW, I went home and I said, oh, I wonder if there's a Wikipedia article and uh, there's the Wikipedia article, but that didn't exist. So I had written it. That's what I did. I spent a week, researched him. He was well established as a reliable, uh, you know, in reliable sources through the United States reporting on his, his crime busting activities. So therefore he was a notable individual in the lexicon of Wikipedia. And I was able to write an article, including all of the stories I showed you here so that people who Google psychic fraud might get this article and read about the other people who were conned and maybe you know, not make themselves victims. And this page, by the way, has got 41,000 plus page views to date. So people, in fact, are reading it. So um, after I did that, I became um, a, a writer officially for the Skeptical Inquirer magazine. And you know, then I reached out to Bob and I said, hey, I, I wrote your Wikipedia article before I really knew, knew anything about you much, but uh, I'd like to get to know some more. And he gave me an interview and actually wrote a two-part article. So once this was on the web, you could Google psychic fraud private eye, go back to that up at the top there, and you would get my articles as well as the Wikipedia article, which was kind of cool. But the thing is, you know, my 
email address is in my skeptical inquirer uh, profile. So I got emails like this. This was the very first one. Somebody wrote me at the well-known skeptic at gmail.com saying she uh, was taken for $42,000. It was her life savings. And she was asking me for help. So this was like a gut punch when I just opened my mail and had been read this. Like, what, what can I do to help this lady? Nothing. I'm not, I'm not in law enforcement. Um, but I did refer her to Bob and Bob told me what I told you. He gets four or five calls a day. He can't take even a, a tiny fraction of the cases and there's no one else who does it. So, so this woman was uh, forced to represent herself in a civil court because in the state of Connecticut Superior Court, wherever this is, uh, this was not considered um, Milford. This was not considered a crime. Uh, you know, a, a legal system, judicial problem where someone would be arrested. You just had to sue them. Hire your own attorney and try to get your money back. So she sent me that. She sent me her handwritten notes to the court about exactly what had happened there, 41,000 plus in a car for some reason. Um, and it was, it was quite incredible. So, and I got other articles like that. So other emails. So I actually took this to heart and I wrote a general column, uh, article for my column on this problem called Belief in Psychics, What's the Harm and Who's to Blame? That title might be familiar because that's the title of this presentation. So yeah, I, I kind of summarize my article in this entire presentation and also expand beyond it. But if, if you Google that article, it's still out there. It's on the web for free. It's a really good resource to send to anybody you know that is going to a psychic. Yeah, so once that was out there, it was even easier to Google psychic fraud and get me and I got other ones. Here's another example. Um, she met a psychic five years ago, scammed of a lot of money, and she wanted the detective, Bob Nagar's information. So I passed it along to Bob. They had a conversation. And then after hearing what was involved, the woman backed out. So she wrote me back, thank you, but I decided to stay anonymous. My family's concerned for safety. And this is common. And the psychics know this is often what happens. So they won't even have to face the legal system. So after seeing all that, you might be somebody who's gone to a psychic or a medium and had you know, a revelation that you think it's true. You know, those are fake people, but they can't all be con artists, right? Uh, I went to someone, they predicted my future correctly. I see it on TV all the time. How could everyone be fake? Someone has got to be real. So injecting a little bit of humor here. So I, I have the inclination sometimes to not go any further to say these people aren't for real and do like um, John Oliver did here. But I'll, you know, I'll, I'll show you what John Oliver said when he covered this in a great episode of last week tonight about psychics. Before we go any further, I am not going to be litigating whether psychics are real in this piece. For one, they're not. See, <laughs> no litigation required. So I wish it was as easy as that. But a lot of times I give these presentations and there are people in the audience and they might be here. I can't see who's in the audience right now who do believe in this. So what I have to say to that, I'll go a little further than John Oliver did, is no one has ever proved they can do this, right? These claims have been investigated, have never been found to be authentic by unbiased researchers, including Harry Houdini, uh, James Randi, and of late Susan Gerbic. Uh, there was a $1 million paranormal challenge out there for decades, I believe, uh, that, that became defunct when James Randi retired and he's now deceased. There are uh, 25 other prizes to be won totaling over $1 million. Right? The largest of those individually is the Center for Inquiries Independ Independent Investigation Group. Uh, currently has a quarter of a million dollars. And by the way, if you know a psychic and they're gonna get that money, you might as well get the referral fee, $5,000. The entire list that, that gets up to the 1 million if you add it all up is in list of prizes for evidence of paranormal on Wikipedia. It's all over the planet, right? And of recent note, I want to point out, I was involved with Richard Saunders from the Skeptic Zone and his project, the Great Australian Psychic Prediction Project, who looked at all the published psychic predictions they could get their handle on, either in newspapers or on YouTube or whatever, for Australian psychics. And it was, I think, somewhere upwards of 200, maybe 300 psychics. And he had over 3,000 predictions, which I was on a team, which then scored. Were the, did it come true? Was it false? Was it, you know, what was it just an obvious thing like, you know, you know, I don't know, the Yankees win five World Series in a row in the next year. I think the Yankees are going to win. And then they win. So we, we rated every prediction uh, like that, including there was one, by the way, 
uh, I see anti-gravity, this was from over 10 years ago or so, uh, anti-gravity would become a reality instead of just a dream. And then the psychic, when they marked their own score for the year, marked that as coming true. They did. So you could see that in other tidbits of information about the Great Australian Psychic Prediction Project. If you Google my report, pondering the published predictions of prominent psychics, I like that alliteration. I wrote that for Skeptical Inquirer on a kind of inside view and the summary of the Great Australian Psychic Prediction Project. So why has never, no one ever proved they can do this, right? Why haven't they come forth and been scientifically evaluated? But why is it not evident from a data analysis of predictions like in the Great Australian Psychic Prediction Project that this is true? Well, standard answer is, well, real psychics don't need the money. They don't have anything to prove. Well, my pushback on that, and people have said that to me, is, well, if they don't need the prize money, then win it and donate it to charity, right? Children's cancer research, something like that. You can turn modern physics on its head, proving you're talking to the dead or you have ESP. You can win a Nobel Prize. Why does that not interest you? Uh, how about proving to everyone there's actually a spirit realm? Um, and a little side note, until I retired, I had, a, I had a security clearance, right? And interestingly, we're warned if someone strange comes up to you on a cruise and starts asking what you do for a living, you have to report it, you have to report that, you have to report this. There's no, no refrain, don't go to a psychic because they're going to read your mind and find out the image, the information damaging to the US. No, they never mention that. You think they would if they knew about it was real. And, and every time you hear psychics talking about, oh, the US government knows about this, the CIA uses psychics, BS. And by the way, the other refrain is, oh, psychic detectives always help solve crimes. Uh, no, they don't. As I got from Bob Nygaard, you know, working for uh, the, the New York State Police Agency, never ever called in a psychic detective. So how, how did these people convince the general public that they are for real? Right, there's several methods. One is cold reading. So here is a, a clip from the Holy Kool-Aid channel talking about cold reading. If I claim to be a psychic and guess that someone in a crowd knows a John Smith, nobody would be impressed. But did you know that James Not John is the most common guy's name in the US? Who is James? Who has the Jim in that family? Or the James? Is the Jimmy or James connected? For girls, the most common name is Mary. The name of either Mary, Margaret. Is there a Mary person, like a Marie, a Mary? Got a connection to Mary. I'm getting Marie, Mary, Maria. And who is the MR name, Mark? Mary Marie. While people are more impressed when a psychic guesses an exact name, more often than not, psychics just guess an initial. I feel he's a he's like a J. He's also showing me a J, J. Why can't they just talk? Why does it got to be, there's a J name, there's a this? Well, because even when guessing the most common guy's name in America, these vultures still get misses. No. Is he J-A or J-U or just, or is he not John or... J, I don't know the name. J, 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 Jerry, Jeffrey. Jez. Jez. Okay, name. close enough. Jez. I probably, I don't know that I get that. No, no. Because no. I with a James. I, I love that one. It's close enough. Yeah, I, I got it. <laughs> uh, yeah, here's another little humorous injection. This is the same guy who was saying, why do they always just, why can't they be clear? That was actually John Edward, and he's one of the biggest psychic cons. Yeah, and... Uh, I like that. He, there's actually a YouTube video of him standing at a convention of Irish people and saying, I'm getting a name, O'Connor, O'Flannery, oh, oh, this, oh, this, oh, this. And no one is saying yes in the audience. <laughs> He's like ultimately failing. On, on, he was going, of course, for the obvious answer. And like no one had the names he was spouting. Uh, so besides the cold reading, there's something that's also called hot reading, also from the Holy Kool-Aid channel. Here's a little clip. Most people don't realize just how much information about them is publicly available on the web. When people buy tickets online to psychic shows, at bare minimum, they enter their full name, billing info, and email address. You may be thinking that a spineless con artist can plug that info into a people search site or a private investigator software package to glean public records, including a person's address, phone number, marital status, criminal background, and more. But they don't even need to do that. In a packed out audience, there are bound to be at least a few dozen people with no Facebook privacy settings set. 
sites like Ancestry.com reveal the names of relatives as well as family death records. And tools like Google Maps and Street View show cross streets, neighborhood info, and even details about what the person's house looks like. Knowing this, is it really that impressive when a psychic says that they're seeing a red door? It's even less impressive when a psychic does a reading of any kind of celebrity figure whose information is publicly accessible all over the web. I'd um, and, and another reason that we know this is not true and, and tricks that are used is uh, Mark Edward wrote a book after having uh, lived the life of, of a psychic for quite a long time on Psychic Friends Network, one of their top performers. And he wrote a book about being on the inside and seeing how it's all done. And like, you know, he's got no powers, but people were, you know, crying at his psychic predictions that they helped, uh, helped them. So it's part of the whole thing of confirmation bias, clearly. So in spite of no evidence, no good evidence that any of this is real, this is the sad, sad tale. The psychic business national revenue, this is already um, six, seven years ago, $2 billion. It's probably gone up way a, a lot since then because of uh, the pandemic, people have moved to the internet who do this, these scams for a living and you can make even more money in a Zoom session than you can renting out a hall because like you don't have to pay anybody anything. There's no overhead. Um, the average psychic at the time was making upwards of $150,000 a year. Please don't take this as career advice, anybody here. Whatever the industry calls reasonably successful, half of a million dollars. Oh, in the industry, by the way, American Federation of Certified Psychics and Mediums. That's where this data is taken from. And, and this is their data. So, and they're certified, so you know they're real. Um, and one of those celebrity mega names, $5 million plus. But, you know, they don't need the money. Um, the amount earned by psychic mediums who have scammed clients, even according to the American Federation of Certified Psychics and Mediums, is $200 million in just the one year period. So no doubt that is the tiny, tiny, tiny tip of a giant iceberg, because if they're admitting that, you know, I don't, I don't even know where they'd get it. Like I told you, the people who don't even report their losses, you know, that would be in no data anywhere. People who, uh, you know, fall through the cracks would be, would be the majority, I would believe. So this is an interesting look at the money spent on psychics. Now this is, you know, this is admitted money. This isn't the giant scams for hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars. This is people who just go and pay for readings, whatever a reading costs, $100 uh, at a shot. But there are people in the left column, you can see go up to $10,000 a year doing this kind of thing. And uh, from the thousand range to the 10,000 range, the number of women um, drops off, but not that much, right? So it's like a, a, a third maybe from the 1,000 to 10,000 range. There's still a significant number of women spending more at the higher number. Men, however, spend a reasonable amount at the lower number. It's still a six to one gender ratio there, but then it gets close to 900 to one at the money, um, at, at, the, at the high money levels. So I'm not quite sure what that means, but that is just a fact of the data. And that's a fact of the data, too. So who's to blame for this, right? Who's to blame for these beliefs? Well, human limitations, memory, perception, biases, reasoning. I actually give another presentation on critical thinking called Critical Thinking 101, which I'm actually going to give for uh, We Can Reason next week. Um, which talks about those specific things that we need to have neuropsychological humility and understanding ourselves and, and not believing that what we, what we see is necessarily what really happened or that what we remember is necessarily what actually happened either. Um, so lack of critical thinking courses, talking about the stuff in early education is partly to blame. Religion plays a part, as you saw in the other poll. Um, 41% of respondents said they believe in psychics, uh, many religious, heavily weighted toward religious people believing it. Um, but as I also pointed out, you know, people who are spiritual, non-particular religion, but they still believe in the spiritual realm, they believe even higher than mainstream religions, which I guess at some level try to tell people not to do this kind, not to go to psychics and Ouija boards are evil and they'll unleash the demons. Um, then of course is group reinforcement. Hey, if almost a majority of your friends believe in it, then maybe they're right, right? And hey, I see it on TV all the time. This can't be fake, right? Uh, so there are cable stations which have their own mediums, 
their own psychics. In, in each case, the, the, the medium bit about talking for the dead is more dynamic than just predicting the future. So in all, in all the cases I know about, the people who make it to the big time on television are not only psychic, but they're mediums, psychic mediums. So Teresa Caputo is on The Learning Channel. I hate that that's the name of that station. And their claim is that she helps individuals connect the spirits of the departed loved ones. No matter what they tell you, it's, oh, it's just for entertainment. No, that's what they report. Uh, Tyler Henry started later, much younger. Uh, he's on the E, at least that's an entertainment network, but they don't claim it's entertainment, right? He demonstrates how he uses his unique gifts of communication with the other side to bring comfort and closure and hope to his clients who are Hollywood celebrities. This is the big problem with, with him because if a Kardashian sits down with him, as has happened, or Matt Lauer sits down with him and he claims to be in contact with their dead relative and they buy it that becomes a news story in of itself and cnn covers it and say hey tyler henry contacted their dead relative um seatbelt psychic lifetime ran this show with thomas john riding around in an uber-like vehicle supposedly picking up random strangers and telling them about their dead relatives that was followed up on another network by the thomas john experience Similarly, driving across the country and stopping in randomly at places with groups of people and doing the same thing. Uh, meet the Frasers. This is Matt Fraser. Uh, you know, he, he's also on E. You know, he's just like us, except for the fact that he was born with the site and he's a top psychic medium. So, unfortunately, those shows dedicate to one person at a time are just a tiny tip of an iceberg, right? Countless appearances of psychics and mediums all over television, especially daytime TV. They're given free reign. They're just filling time and the sponsors like that. You know, they're dynamic. They know how to talk to people. They're unchallenged by people who know what they're doing and the tricks they're doing. And here's just a quick sampling from the John Oliver uh, episode that I showed you before about psychics. My next guest started communicating with the dead when she was just a toddler. She's a wife and a mom who also happens to talk to dead people. Please welcome celebrity pet psychic. Our next guest is a clairvoyant to the stars. We're back with a group of friends who share a very unique bond. They are all psychic. Yeah, so that's cardiac surgeon Dr. Oz, who is uh, now, if I'm understanding correctly, running for the U.S. Senate. Yeah, they're all psychic. Oh, by the way, the person to Dr. Oz is right. Uh, is Gwyneth Paltrow's personal psychic medium. And uh, I have a little slide in her later because she got her own commercial on the, uh, the, the Netflix show, The Goop Lab, thanks to Gwyneth Paltrow. So many influential media outlets beyond TV, right? Print, online, joining this selling of nonsense to the public. There is a, a guy who is billed as the medical medium, Anthony William. He's given a, pla a platform by the aforementioned Gwyneth Paltrow on her Goop website, right? She wrote, he's one of the most unconventional and surprisingly insightful healers today. And the voice of a divine force called spirit, which I believe is from the future, by the way, too. I think there's time travel involved there. Guides him to identify the roots of his patient's hard to diagnose illness and find the best solution to restore their health. So why Gwyneth and Anthony Williams are not taken up for medical malpractice, I don't understand the law, frankly. As I mentioned, this is um, Laura Lynn Jackson on the right. That's the same one Dr. Oz had in that group. And she got her own episode of the six episode series of the first season of the Goop Lab, which was all about psychic mediumship being real and everyone can do it. And she's just, you know, really good at it. And the person on her left, Dr. Julie Bichelle, she works, she's, she's a PhD in something having to do with biology, I believe, but she works at some paranormal institute that supposedly has proven not only psychics are real, mediums are real, but people can levitate. So yeah, you take that for what it's worth. But she was, she was the science guest on that episode of the Goop Lab. And here is a little uh, quote from, a little audio clip from Laura Lynn Jackson talking to Gwyneth Paltrow. If you ask for signs and messages, like really specific concrete ones from the other side, you will get them. You don't need a psychic medium to prove it to you. So wait, are we all psychic? We can all do this. And I think we all start out intuitive and we develop our psychic abilities. And my sense of it is, is the more you open and the more you develop, it's almost like the higher you're able to perceive or the louder your volume switches. 
and that kind of highest level or that highest energy is being able to perceive consciousness and spirit form and mm -hmm. be a receptor of that. Wow. Yeah, that was Gwyneth Paltrow with the wow. Wow, I say wow too. Um, so I asked the uh, previously mentioned Bob Niger to watch that episode and he did for me because I wanted his opinion. I asked him, does Gwyneth Paltrow know the harm she's doing by convincing people that this nonsense is real? And uh, this is what he had to say. I wouldn't presume to know whether or not Gwyneth Paltrow understands the gravity of promoting self-proclaimed psychics, but I fear that Paltrow's The Goop Lab episode, Are You Into It?, will increase the likelihood of more vulnerable people being defrauded. Yep, thank you, Gwyneth. Uh, and to show that this is not a new problem, you know, psychics being promoted on TV like they're real, this goes way back to 2007. It's the earliest thing I could find uh, of uh, the business of believing in the paranormal and the occult and the supernatural, all of this total nonsense, this, this medieval thinking, I think something should be done about that. And it all lies in education. Largely, it's the media who are to blame for this sort of thing. They shamelessly promote all kinds of nonsense of this sort because it pleases the sponsors. It's the bottom line, the dollar line. That's what they're looking Yep. So unfortunately, it's just getting worse. The um, so, so what is the connection? I've been talking about the media. James Randi was talking about the media causing these beliefs. But what's the connection of that to what I was talking about before? You know, individuals getting ripped off hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars on a street corner store psychic that they walked into. Like, what's the connection? John Oliver put it very succinctly. I'm going to let him tell you. Because this surprisingly large, often predatory industry relies on popular culture to lend it credence and validity. To put it another way, every time a psychic makes a grieving widow cry on Dr. Oz, 10 con artists get their wings. The sad truth. So, here's an interesting quote on the subject. Any and all media outlets perpetrating the public's belief in psychic powers have substantial bloodstain all over their hands. Somebody needs to send that quote into the, uh, you know, the quote of the week on the skeptic's guide to the universe. It's been out there for a while and no one ever has. Uh, I wrote that in 2019. <laughs> so that's the last sentence in my article that I talked about before. What's the harm and who's to blame a skeptical inquirer? Um, yeah, I believe that wholeheartedly. So besides the mainstream media, like you, you can't avoid this stuff. You, these are like things that are sold in bookstores or they're, they're slapped in storefront windows. They're ads for you know, upcoming presentations or buy my CD or buy my book, or they are books. I was driving to a restaurant and stopped because I saw this sign. Uh, yeah, so to, in order to gain funding, uh, this high school <laughs> had a psychic fair. What better way to introduce your children to the fact that psychics are real, you know, go to them for help by then by having a, uh, a, a fair and a fundraiser right in school. Uh, th these days regarding the whole thing with the internet, right? It's all over the internet. Find the best online medium. If you Google it, you'll, you'll so, so many pages, you can't check them all out. Um, this is an interesting one. You put your email in there and you claim a free psychic reading. I put my own email in there. I am gullible at gmail.com. Uh, and of course, you know, the first one is free, but uh, so this is something that came up when I was looking at uh, an answer on Quora. So this is where people send questions in and experts and fields answer them. You know, I have ones about the space industry and, and uh, computer technology, but there's one where people answer about spiritual questions. So somebody sent in my son's diagnosed with psychosis. His messages from spirits and sea spirits. Do this exist together or is the psychosis a gift? And then the guy is officially one of the responders. Oh, no, it's often the case that it's diagnosis psychosis, but it's, it's really, he's got powers. You know, don't accept it. Don't accept, you know, psycho, psycho, psychotic drugs. Uh, you know, talk openly. He, he has a gift. Uh, it, it's quite astounding. And then someone else replied, yes, your son has a gift. My niece also sees and talks to spirits and doctors diagnosed her as having a mental illness. So this is the kind of things that's promoted by believers. So as I mentioned, things have maybe gotten even worse during the pandemic. Um, you know, it, it's just all over the place online these days. People have learned that they can make even more money on the web. 
Uh, this is Cardi B. She sang some, some song about wet cats, as I remember. Um, so she's known as a WAP singer. Uh, she's turned up on Instagram and Facebook to give psychic readings in 2021. Uh, so, you know, it's not good enough to have a rap, a rap uh, career. She has to start doing this online to make more money. And then you get law enforcement stepping into this. So this is a police chief uh, who made his local paper in Rhode Island because he said, uh, if you're grieving, go see a medium. It'll help you. And, and this was in the article, you know, one of the constituents in, in, his, uh, in his jurisdiction said, hey, you know, if it's good enough for him, I was a skeptic, but I'm not a skeptic any longer because if he believes it, it gives me enough evidence, it's probably true. Thanks a lot. Uh, this is something that has been online for a long time. It's a giant facility in Florida. And this is the list of their facilitators. So oh, I'm gonna go back to that. The third on the list, Eben Alexander, and two down from that, Raymond Moody, are kind of famous in the field uh, of um, near-death experiences. Uh, Eben Alexander wrote, uh, was a neuroscientist, is a neuroscientist, had his own near-death experience, you know, decided it was real and not just his brain malfunctioning and wrote a book about visiting heaven. Raymond Moody uh, actually came up with the term near-death experience. Uh, so this is a place that teaches people about all these things. You can go and pay others to do it and you can learn to do it yourself. Probably tons of those all over the country. That's one I know about. A pertinent expression about this subject is it is easier to fool people than to convince them that they have been fooled. So that's attributed to Mark Twain. I won't say he said it because a lot of things are attributed to him. It's hard to back that up, but that is certainly true, right? Once somebody falls for this and has had, you know, a, 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 a psychic, a con artist, a medium, convince them that they were talking to their dead relatives, it's hard to ever tell them that, no, that, that was uh, a trick and you were fooled. And so the corollary to that is if you think you can't be fooled, then you may actually be a fool. And no, Mark Twain didn't say that. Another little injection of humor from the popular press. So uh, yes, there are pet psychics. There's a Wikipedia article on that subject. So these are people who either say that they can read the mind of your living animal or the one who's passed on to the pearly gates. So, you know, what is being done? What can be done? Well, one of the things is the, the skeptical organizations attempt to out these people by telling the world what they're really doing, right? And one, one of the most successful ones was done fairly recently. This was a sting run against medium Thomas John. He's the person who was in the show I talked, showed you TV Seatbelt Psychic and the Thomas John experience, right? It showed that he used details planted in faked Facebook accounts in his readings of Mark Edward and Susan Garbick. So those are two people from the skeptical arena. Mark Edward is the one who wrote Psychic Blues. Susan Garbick investigates and writes about psychics and mediums. They were undercover. They sat in his audience and Thomas John called upon them from the stage. And they had had faked Facebook accounts made in fake names that they attended under with fake relatives that fake died. And TJ just told them all about those people trying to contact him and talking to them. Uh, and just so that TJ, when he was called out on it later, couldn't say, oh, I was reading your mind. Susan and Mark did not know the details of the, it was a double blind experiment, essentially, right? And just so, you know, I don't get sued, I often will say, well, there was a way it could have been real with spirits, right? Perhaps the spirits that Thomas John was in contact with read the faked Facebook data and they fed it to him because they don't like him and they wanted to embarrass him. But somebody read the faked Facebook information and told TJ about it himself, his compatriots who work for him, or spirits. Use Occam's razor there. Right, so that was called Operation Pizza Roll. And this is the headline that was in the New York Times. None other than New York Times Magazine, feature article all about this. And, and that was big news because they have a, you know, a very big reading. After that came out, people, you know, actually reported on the fact that it was in the New York Times and what the details were. Holy Kool-Aid uh, has a fantastic video that shows the faked Facebook accounts, plays the audio from the reading. So if you really want to see the inside story, what happened there, 
Google that Thomas John, the seatbelt psychic busted for cheating on YouTube. So, you know, once all that came out, you know, Penn Jillette tweeted about it, which was kind of cool. Uh, Hemet Mehta, the friendly atheist, talked about it, even, even made showbiz cheat sheets. Um, and Jezebel, of course, psychics are reading your Facebook thing. But, you know, all of this, you know, gets superseded by the next big news event, and it's kind of, uh, it's kind of dropped. So, um, eventually, not too late after, Thomas John opened that Caesar's Palace in Vegas. So this was less than a year after he was thoroughly embarrassed by a New York Times article proving he, he had fraudulently done these readings. He still got a show at Caesar's Palace where he became the act. Um, the Las Vegas Society of Skeptics worked with the aforementioned Susan Gerbic, and they attended many of the opening week shows, and they documented how he was doing the readings there by having plants, by people he had read before, by knowing he was sitting in what seats, all that's documented in Susan's articles and on Wikipedia. Um, so interestingly, right, this was right before the pandemic hit and his TJ show closed at the start of the pandemic, even though he had many shows planned out for months and months because he didn't see it coming. Although retroactively, he put a Facebook uh, live stream out where he said he saw it coming years ago. So this was just reminiscent of that issue. So as I mentioned, these people move to, uh, to Zoom and other online platforms to make money while they can't rent halls and take suckers in person, and they can make even more money. So in early 2021, just about a year ago, Thomas John held a spirit circle for children. He advertised it for ages five to 12 and charged $400 each to put them in contact with their dead relatives. Uh, they had to have a parent with them. And of course it was the parent who booked it. And it was two hours long, something like that. The story is told in Operation On Your Ring and in that the full title is at the bottom, Skeptical Inquirer Online. Um, and you know, each of them got maybe a 10 minute reading for $400. And if you multiply, you know, do the math there, that's really good money for a few hours for Thomas John. And there was a skeptical response to that. When this was publicized well in advance to try to get people to sign up for it, uh, Steve Novella wrote, it's disturbing when self-proclaimed psychic mediums insert themselves into the grieving process. And you could read the rest of it there, but it was you know, heavily weighted towards this should not be done, stop it. And it, it, it was not possible to stop it because you can't tell Zoom not to do something. And, and Thomas John has you know, no conscience in the area. So, one thing we, we need to do is once, once the news is over and it's superseded by other stories, uh, it comes out of the public consciousness. So the guerrilla skeptics use Wikipedia uh, to you know, try to highlight these things in the articles on skeptics and uh, despite what some people don't like on the bios of these con artists. Uh, if it's published in a reliable source that they're doing these things by fraudulent means, it could be possibly put on the Wikipedia page. So why Wikipedia? So look at that number at the bottom. Then that's not a typo. It's for a one year period taken in, as the pandemic was starting actually, um, 95 billion with a B views. So there's not that many people on earth so clearly extraterrestrials are using Wikipedia. Or people use it, the same person uses it a lot frequently. But it's interesting, you can actually see the spike towards the right side. Uh, when the pandemic was starting, people using Wikipedia and probably researching what the hell is going on? What's coronavirus? So uh, Thomas John, the aforementioned uh, psychic, you know, ha had a page and, and now it, it says that the New York Times sting operation, uh, you know, was successful and it, it shows what on his Wikipedia article. So for all time, even though you might not find that New York Times Magazine article anymore. If you Google Thomas John, and uh, off on the right side of the Google search, you'll see Wikipedia. And if you open it up, this is what you're going to read. It'll talk about the fact that he, that he, you know, conned people in this sense. And even the Spirit Circle Communication of Event for Children was added to the Wikipedia article. And as I mentioned, uh, this is a Google search at the top. Thomas John Psychic. Yeah, you get, you know, he, when he was playing at Caesar's Palace, you get his own website, Thomas John Celebrity Medium, and then you get Wikipedia. So hopefully 
enough people go there before just going directly to his site and so they don't get conned. Also, the important thing about Wikipedia is journalists read it. Um, this, is, this is a website where a, the journalist uh, Anushka Pinto read the Wikipedia article and you know, she wrote her article about Thomas John covering it, even uh, including the picture of Susan and Mark. And this was a letter to me and Susan regarding, because uh, we, we both wrote her and said, thank you for that article. And she you know, replied that she was appreciative and that she uses Wikipedia in that sense, right? She did use Wikipedia. So the, one of the other uh, psychics, mediums that I showed you, who is the Hollywood medium, Tyler Henry, um, before skeptics improved his page, and I will say improved, this is what it looked like. It was literally three paragraphs, so maybe six sentences. Basically, oh, he's got the show. He's a medium. He had his ability since he was a kid. And now his article looks like this. It's got, you know, the fact that skeptics realize that he's doing hot and cold readings with all the articles that are talking about the details. The CFI gave him the independent investigations group, gave him the truly terrible television award that's reported uh, in here. And why is this important? Tyler Henry, these are his page views over several years. And the spike is probably each time one of his new seasons of his show started. So cumulatively in that period of time for so years, uh, 2 million people, you know, viewed his page. And this is a little bit down in the page, a critical analysis. He's called the grief vampire because that is what people in the skeptics organizations call psychic mediums. And interestingly, as I mentioned, um, the people in the press read Wikipedia and sometimes use it for their um, articles. So this is USA Today Sports. Ronda Rousey is a female fighter. She sat down with Tyler Henry on the Hollywood medium. And this could have been a puff piece about, oh, she got in contact with a dead relative through Tyler Henry. But because this uh, author read the Wikipedia article, he threw in Grief Empire and Truly Terrible Television Award. And, you know, was very skeptical in his writing about it. So what the skeptic community is doing, running sting operations uh, to expose famous psychics and mediums, spotlighting their deceptions and media outlets, and when we can in Wikipedia using Wikipedia reliable sources, such as the New York Times and sometimes Skeptical Inquirer, we hope. Um, we confront media outlets and others who promote these people for their own financial gain. Um, and like Mark Edwards says, by the way, um, it's impossible to you know, do everything about the situation. His quote was, I can't do much about the rottenness of the big picture, but I know there is, I, I know work to, to see if we can put our best efforts into activism and exposing the lower spectrum of the lie culture, right? Psychics and mediums, we can make a difference. And he is beseeching people to join a local grassroots skeptical group like this one and do something. So what you can do, educate yourself on this subject. Uh, don't become a victim, absolutely, right? Share your perspective with average friends and family so they don't become victims. Uh, and I wanted to show you some Wikipedia articles on the subject. Uh, if, you, if you got a smartphone, I'll put the whole page here, you can snap it. But th these, are, these are the pages I would recommend to start with. Skeptical movement, fortune telling, fraud, psychic mediumship, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then there are other resources. This is also something that's good to snap with your phone. These, these are online resources that have to do with this subject, specifically about Thomas John. It's the New York Times article I mentioned. It's my column. It's uh, Susan's column. It's things like this. banned when you when you upload this uh probably edit that out so uh thank you very much uh my skeptical heart column is at that short address 
And you can actually, if you have a smartphone, snap that QR code right there and subscribe to me, follow me on Facebook. And thank you very much. Clap, 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 clap. Thank you, Rob. Do you have time for a few questions? I absolutely. 57 minutes. All right. Not bad. Pretty much snailed it. Not everybody all at once. I'm wondering uh, why do you think that there's such a discrepancy between males and females in pain for psychics? Oh, I don't want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> what a smart man. Get yourself in trouble. <laughs> the thing I will say is it, it's not reflecting in all pseudoscience and claims like that, right? Because if you go to a UFO convention, a Bigfoot convention, it's likely to be the other way. So there's different interests for some reason or other. But yeah, but it's not like, you know, men are impervious to false beliefs. <laughs> There's somebody in the chat, Rob, asking if you could put that tiny URL in the chat. I think I can. Thank you. Um, so yeah. So so it's interesting. I, I talked to, to Bob Nygaard just the other day, um, just to catch up on things. I might I might interview him again because it's been a while and. You know, it, it, it's I haven't done anything since the pandemic started, really, with him. And um, you know, things have gotten a lot worse. He said, "I'm leveraging uh, at least five calls or emails a day on the subject in relation to these cases. It's really sad. I'm com it's completely out of my control. Uh, the my appearance on the, the show, The Con, which I I showed you before, uh, which is now on Hulu, is driving a lot of calls my way." People are really getting fleeced big time by con artists during this pandemic and there's nothing we can do. Um, and then he said, in addition to psychic fraud, I'm getting a lot of calls and emails about sweetheart swindles. People are really lonely out there because of the pandemic, especially and the con oh. artists know it and are taking advantage <laughs> of it. So yeah, B Bob got into this um, by way of being on the Bunko Squad when he was uh, a New York State ah. uh, cop. And this was part of his thing, but he also got into you know, the, the sweetheart swindles and other things like that. Even people who would come and say, oh, you know, give me $5,000 deposit, I'm gonna replace your roof and then they're gone. Uh, you know, a whole bunch of con stuff like that. But he, he got pulled heavily into this once he retired and went to Florida. In fact, the story in him is he, he, he retired from the police force, moved from New York to Florida, was like, you know, planning never to work again in his life at 55. And in a short order, two women, uh, were, he was chatting two women up. One happened to be a doctor and one was a nurse at the same hospital. And he told them what his story was. And then after one of the two women left, the nurse, the doctor came back and said, I couldn't tell you in front of the nurse, but I was taken by a psychic and I'd love you to take my case. And that was the first one he took as a detective. He got a detective's license. Huh. And he started working it and like that was something like 12 years ago and that's been his career now second career i can't imagine there's a ton of money in being a psychic fraud investigator well you know i don't know i've actually it's kind of private so i've never talked to him about that but a lot of times what you do is you take a percent of the money you get back kind of like a lawyer does in a case right so mm, could be good money i don't i don't know but it, oh God, it sounds dangerous to me. He's talked about the details. You know, you're going in the seediest parts of the, of the town and these people are dangerous. They have friends who are dangerous because they're protecting a lot of money. Um, you know, something I wouldn't do. Yeah. <laughs> have you looked into any kind of uh, cultural or familial kind of background that uh, encourages people to become psychic? Uh, when I lived in South America, it was everybody had a went to somebody with a crystal ball or palm reader. I mean, everybody. Um, but and uh, I mean, does uh, what about the the gypsy? Well, yeah. So so that that term has become derogatory, and Bob realized it when he used it once with me. He said, "Oh yeah, no, I'm sorry, I said that. Let's call them the Romani people." He said. 
So yeah, mm -hmm. from Romania, I mean, there's a cultural thing for sure. He said from that part of Eastern Europe, uh, it, it's like family, he said, whole families come over and they just are all into, it's, it's essentially um, like a mafia. They're, they're, it's a criminal syndicate. Everyone in the family just does criminal activities. The men do roofing and driveway, you know, scams, and the women do psychic stuff. Uh, and they're just taught by the relatives, like the grandmother teaches the mother and the mother teaches the kids, or, or the grandfather teaches the sons. And he's, you know, of course, not all Romani people, I have to say that, not all, but, you know, there seems to be a large percent of the people practicing that he comes into contact with, where that's their background. Mm -hmm. In, in uh, my my previous religion, they like they were like the which was what Romero uh, Pentecostal. Yeah, so uh, like they were the you know the the preachers who uh, got a lot of money, and you know they did these all these miracles and whatever. But then there were like the the congregation that were also. Uh, you know, like pretend that they were doing all these healings and stuff, but they obviously they're not going to get any money. But there was that, like that uh, interest in, like I guess, like practicing your powers even though you're not getting any money. Is there mm -hmm. that? Do they take thing? donations? Do they take donations? Because sometimes that's how they get around it, right? I didn't, you know, I didn't charge them anything, but they can donate to me. Well, like for example, like my mother would, you know, pray for people and think that she was healing somebody, but it was never on her mind to to get any money for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, yeah, that that's kind of in line of question people ask me as well as other people who investigate this stuff. Uh, you know, do 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 any anybody does anybody who's claiming to be psychic believe it? And it's always hard to get into a person's head. And I would say, yes, there's some percent of people who have been self-deluded because of confirmation bias, that they've told enough people the right things by luck. And, and they, you know, they remember the hits when they're praised. So they say something that's not right. They're not told that. So they come to believe it themselves. Yeah, I, I would more likely believe it's people who are, are not charging, helping friends occasionally like that, who believe that, you know, uh, but not the people clearly who are doing the kind of cons that Bob comes into contact with. And certainly not the people on television. Give me a J name, give me an M name. You know, you, you could see from that video, that's a script. They know what they're doing. They're not going to say, give me a Q name. You know, it, it's, it's mm -hmm. the, they're going for the big hits. Oh, did they have some, I, I'm seeing a medical problem somewhere in the chestal area. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, or they, maybe they died in an accident. You know, it's pretty likely either heart attack or an accident. You know, um, it, it's, it's kind of despicable. And especially when you get to the people that we've proven are hot readers, you know. There, there is like no way that these people don't know what they're doing. I actually only came into contact with somebody who was a self-proclaimed psychic once. It was at a former ghost hunter, Kenny Biddle's house. He was going to present at PsyCon and he asked me as a skeptic and other people from the paranormal realm that he still friends with to come over to his house for a dry run. So we got to see his presentation and you know, we gave him some critiques and then people filed out. And the last few people were me and two women who use, or are still ghost hunters and believe in that and also believe they're psychic mediums. So we talked about that. And it was the first time I ever talked one-on-one -on -one with somebody who was admitting that. And yeah, I believe both of those people believe it. They don't charge people for it. They say, I get, I'm a gift. Sometimes I get like to help my friend because she says she's lonely or she wants to hear from a grandfather. And I, you know, to me, it seemed like she believed it especially if she's not trying to make any money off of it. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, yeah. I, I would guess some pe a lot of people get money and then a lot of people get uh, at least subconsciously some ego strokes from doing it. Yeah, absolutely. You become special. You have a, you know, a superpower, right? Yeah. Right. I, I, I'm interested in that study that broke down uh, belief in psychics into religions. It is unfortunate that they didn't go beyond uh, Christian religions. Yeah, I don't uh, get to that. see. I mean, in Judaism, yes. where there's no belief in an afterlife, uh, what is the percentage that believe in psychics? Right. Uh, yeah, or or in Islam, where they do, it's fairly you know synonymous with Christianity regarding an afterlife and demons and you know jinn or demons and things like that. So yeah, I would expect that to be similar. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I I was raised Catholic and I don't really remember 
like any special talks about this in church that you shouldn't go to psychics or play with a Ouija board or whatever. But I hear from Pentecostal people, maybe Romero can talk to that, where it's like you're warned against that because it's gonna open the gates of hell. Yeah, we were we were warned against uh, psychics uh, because you're like the idea was that like the devil was giving you that power to uh, communicate with spirits. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. And if I remember right from the from the poll, the evangelical number mm -hmm. was the lowest of the Christians. So it's kind of interesting. If, if you're if you're warned away from it for the reason you just gave, you really do believe it. <laughs> you're just not going to practice it. So I don't know if they were answering the question correctly. Do you not believe it? Do you believe in it? No, I don't. Well, if, if you're purposely not going to play with a Ouija board because the demons are going to come out of it, then you should have answered yes to that. <laughs> you know, I believe yeah. in spirits and an afterlife and whatever. Rob, I noticed you had uh, basically one slide and a few uh, a few sentences worth of treatment of um, animal psychics. Have pet you got any deeper following that thread? No. Well, from personal experience, my wife is a therapist and she had a client who was also going to see a pet psychic to communicate with her dead animal. And you know, then the question comes: Do 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 you? push back on that with you know your therapy clients <laughs> right. my wife my wife is not the type to do that and it's like you know she 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 was always getting good answers like she's spending some money and uh, you know oh yeah whatever i don't remember if it was a dog or a cat even but fido is happy and she loves you for giving her good life and like you know it was making her client feel really good about what she was hearing <laughs> you know yeah. I, I don't think i could have gone with that with my client because she was paying her a reasonable amount of money which unlike my you know my wife's payments were not paid for by any kind of insurance and and and, and there is the danger which is part of my presentation that if you let someone just believe in this without any pushback there is a chance they will walk into a psychic shop where they will be ripped off for their life savings <laughs> that that is the big harm in this that like it's like it's slippery slope that's a fallacy in some cases but i don't think in this case it is uh it, you know at least for a significant number of people like i said four or five get bob's niagara number a day that's i don't know how many that would be who don't find him or don't know what to do have no one to call and or commit suicide he tells a story of someone on a ledge who he talks back from the ledge because he had given all of his money to the psychic um you know how often does that happen in people's lives and yeah, it starts yeah. when everyone around you believes in psychics and just reinforces it and you see it on television and you know, no one pushes back on it in any significant way. And it's like, yeah, of course this is real. And I've actually heard pushback. Well, well, you know, there are bad doctors. There are, you know, lying auto mechanics. Yeah, that's true. People, people can be scum, but you really need your car repaired. <laughs> you really need to go to a doctor. You don't need to go to anybody claiming to have paranormal psychic abilities because it's fake. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you have to take a chance and do your research when you find somebody to fix anything in the world for you, your you know plumbing or whatever. Uh, but uh, yeah, you don't need to take the, the gamble roll on going to see a psychic and putting your trust in somebody who can't actually do anything real for you, but can rip you off for your life savings if you let them. Maybe an untapped market is psychic auto mechanic. Yeah. I, I was going to say well, we should look into the field of psychic to uh, inanimate objects. Well, uh, Yuri Geller. Yuri Geller comes to mind, right? Yeah. That, uh, Bend metal with his mind, right? So you can yeah. fix a carburetor, like tweak the tweak Seems the like good. Right. Uh, I, I would not have ever wanted to get on a plane with Uri Geller. Right. <laughs> what if he fell asleep and started to dream of bending the blades in the jet engine? You know, there you go. You go down. Yeah. So. Well, someone would say that uh, most people in IT are inanimate object psychics. <laughs> someone years ago did a cartoon series on psychic automobile mechanics. It was quite hilarious. <laughs> Uh, so Brian Brian said they uh, they found this for the first time uh, and they're going first to her GSW. Yeah, it's not something that's widely known, but if you if you Google Gorilla Skeptics on Wikipedia, Brian, that's the full name. Um, or GSOWteam.org. Yeah, thank you. 
Jeff is a member. Romero's a member. Right. Did you, you graduate yet? People like you is said it, you did wouldn't. you graduate, Romero? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. <right. laughs> Everyone shame <laughs> Romero into <also>, finishing up. <laughs> also shame Faith. So. And, and faith, 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 faith. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've got faith. I was hoping on, you wouldn't remember. <laughs> I've got faith recorded agreeing to uh, to do. Yeah, oh, that's great. That's great. <laughs> I'll get there. I'll get there. <laughs> I had to bleep a lot of swears from that. <laughs> you better make good. I so missed, just, this is Dora Moon. Uh, I Moon. I missed all that. What? Join what? <laughs> Oh, the gorilla skeptics on Wikipedia. Probably. Oh, the girl skeptics on okay. Gor gorilla, gorilla skeptics. Okay. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Sorry about that. I didn't know what that was. No, no problem. Hey, hey Jeff, do you, you want to put you want to put our promo in there? You can find a YouTube promo. Uh, yeah. Let me see if I can dig one up. Y'all carry on without me. I'll be back. Yeah. So, so actually, there, there's a question to you folks uh, in this club specifically. Someone asking. How often do you meet? I think I saw that somewhere. Where was that? Oh yeah, Brian was asking that. How how often do you, does Triangle Skeptics yeah, meet? We Romero? meet the the third and fourth Wednesday of every month, and the the third Wednesday is like a talk or you know some discussion like this, and then the fourth Wednesday is uh, we call it Culture Club where we do a either we read a book or watch a, a movie or something and then discuss it. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed the last. Uh, what did, 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 you, did you do? Don't look up. Did you do that one? Is that what you did? No, we did. Um, what was it? The, the flat Earth documentary. Oh yeah, 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 that uh, one. Yeah, behind the curve. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. I was otherwise occupied. I wanted to come to that one. I had I had watched that documentary twice quite a while ago. But yeah, it's a good documentary. Yes. Yeah. Talk about people getting sucked into a belief system. Ugh. It, I would have never thought when I was a kid that, you know, I hit the toilet them for services. So you know, that, that's the first, that's the first hurdle Nygaard faces, uh, you know, getting the police to actually read the rules of their own jurisdiction to see this is fraud. But so, okay, this, this saddens me and, and Bob talks about this sometimes. So if you go to a psychic and you spend $10,000 because they claim they can reach your dead relative and every week, you have a reading, and then even if they come out later and say, "No, nah, I wasn't really reaching your dead relative," you know this is not going to happen. But the ultimate extreme for a legal case, mm -hmm. I was just fooling you. Um, you you can't sue them for anything. Um, that's not fraud, according to most jurisdictions, because you got a service, them telling you they were talking to dead relatives, which you knew that was what you were going to get to begin with. The only kinds of crimes he can prosecute is if is a subset, it's an extremely small subset. So again, anyone who gets taken that way, you're just screwed. But these people who are taken for huge sums of money, what often happens is they're convinced that, and again, here is the religiosity and spirituality comes in, that the money is the root of all evil literally, or their, their gold possessions are the root of all evil, and they are inhabited by evil spirits. And you have to give this to the psychic to do some rituals that she's got to pay a lot of money to learn how to do so that's why i need some money too um and so and they say well after that after i expunge the spirits i'll give it all back to you and they don't give it back to you that's outright fraud by any legal right i've taken this product who i said i'm going to get back to you and i don't give it back to you so that's the kind of the only kind of thing he can prosecute So, so that's, you know, that's a small subset of people's money being taken by these people. Does it vary a lot from state to state? Yeah, I, I, yeah I'm not in, embedded in the legal system, so I don't know. I would imagine it does. Um, I, our state tends to be stiffer on fraud against the elderly. You know, they, yeah, and certainly elderly are taking advantage more than other and and again coming back to religiosity that is something they play upon they find out what your beliefs are and then they play on them and one of the most egregious examples of that that bob told me about one of his cases was a client i mean, we're doing this from memory from like four years ago so i'm probably not gonna get the details right but generally the story is a uh, woman went had 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 miscarriage you know and uh 
she was near term, I think, and she was now pregnant again and was, and was uh, really scared she was going to have another miscarriage. So she went to the psychic, you know, for re, for, um, to, to feel good about it, to, to hear good words. No, you're, you're going to be fine. You're going to have the baby. And instead, you know, oh, you're going to lose this baby too, unless I take the evil juju off of you, which is why you mm -hmm. lost the first baby. And, you know, for months, money went to the psychic on that. And that wasn't enough. Then I see the spirit of your, your prematurely uh, dead fetus burning in hell. And the only way you can save it and free it to heaven is if you pay me more money to do these incantations and things. Yeah. So she, she actually went there. These, these people have no, no humanity. No sense of decency. I found that promo if you'd like me to uh, play it back. Yeah, you want to play it live? Yeah, we'll go. We'll go. For those who haven't heard it. You know, I got to say, Bigfoot's BS, oh, but the Chupacabra is totally the result of top secret government genetic experiments on a remote island. Taking medical advice from Gwyneth Paltrow, like steaming your lady parts and putting jade eggs all up in there, is a great. Oh, what happened? Mm. Buffering. buffering. Buffering is what happened. Dang it. Buffering. To improve your health. Police from around the world regularly use psychics to solve crimes. They just don't talk about it. Spontaneous human combustion is for sure a real thing. I've read all about it on the internet, and I worry someday it's going to happen to me. We all have friends and family who believe these things and much more. Well, if you are a rational thinker who is tired of arguing on social media and never getting anywhere, we have a solution for you. Join the Guerrilla Skepticism and Wikipedia team, and we will teach you how to add reliable scientific and skeptical information to the world's number one source of information, Wikipedia. We write new articles and improve existing ones. We remove pseudoscience, paranormal, and alt-med claims, substituting the actual facts. And we operate in many languages. We've already reached tens of millions of people searching for information, but as you can imagine, we can never do enough. So please join us. All you need is a PC, a Facebook account, and a desire to help educate the planet. In fact, you'll be educating the world while you sleep. Contact us at gsowteam at gmail.com. Guerrilla skepticism. skepticism. The, the time, time is, is now. now. Music by purpleplanet.com. Thank you, Jeff. Glad to do it. Yeah, that, that was actually fun. I produced those and, and I got, you know, well-known voices in the, in the skeptical world from podcasters to, to either write what they wanted to say, which is the exact opposite of what they believe, or I wrote a script for them <laughs> in yeah. a similar vein. And I know at about, least one of them actually used to be terrified of the thing that they... Uh... Susan Garbick <laughs> did not... Uh, you know, did not like the idea of spontaneous human combustion because she thought it was going to happen to her as a teenager. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I got, I got, I got people from like, uh, let's see, that was Richard Saunders. Who else was in there? I forget now. Ben Radford was in ben there. Rad ben Radford started it off right. I also got two people and different ones from the skept the Skeptics Guide to the Universe, uh, and uh, yeah, Celestia Ward from the uh, Squaring the Strange, so and Hammett Meta from the Friendly Atheist. Uh, it was really cool to work with those people and to get them to uh, to, to do the, to do the little, their little bits. How how long does the training take to do GSOW? Um, I, I did it in a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks or so. Um, but you know that was kind of on the short end. I've actually heard of people doing it in two. Some people take a few months or longer. Uh, there's some people who just procrastinate forever. Yes. <laughs> no, even no, no, I didn't mean you. Faith. I haven't. No, I haven't even started. I, I know. Still has to do this project. So no. I think the record was somebody two two years before they actually literally did start doing stuff and did the final project. Just don't 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 pass the two years, Faith. Oh, okay. Yeah, I would say that it's not it's not hard. Um, I just have uh, a job. No no excuse, but uh, yeah. I, you know, if you're interested, I think that uh, it's really not hard. And then yeah. uh, probably it's just a lot of intimidation thinking that, oh, I need to be in the mindset of doing it and, uh, and like set aside some time. But probably if I just like 
set it a little bit here and there, it would be not that bad. Yeah, it's, it's, start, it's, it's unlike if you jump into Wikipedia. Well, I'll give you an example. The first time I added to Wikipedia was in the early 2000s. I had gone to Star Trek The Experience in Las Vegas, which was a you know, 4D ride simulator that like you were really on the USS Enterprise D. And anyway, I, I was really blown away. And I came home and I Googled it. And, oh my God, there's a Wikipedia article. And the whole description of it was wrong. So I spent hours that weekend fixing it. And the next day, it was back the way it originally was. I was so pissed off, I never edited Wikipedia again until I found GSOW and found out the right way to do things. Because it's like, you know, that's what can happen if you just jump in and think, oh, I can do this myself. You really don't know the rules and, you know, what you can do and what you shouldn't do. There's a corporate culture you have to deal with the other editors, just like in any company dealing with your, your coworkers. And if you just jump in, you know, full steam ahead, I, I, I know how to fix this, you're likely going to be very disappointed. So one of the things Susan's come up with is, is a nice, easy training method where there's a lot of support. You know, the rest of the editors who've been through this are there to help you along in, in GSOW. Um, and we have each other's backs. So that's that's the good part of that. And as I picked uh, somebody, because like, you have to do a final like Wikipedia article at the end. And I wanted to do uh, like a Hispanic scientist women or something like that to you know, showcase that. And so I started going through a list and Wikipedia entries of, of uh, sign, uh, scientists like that. Like, oh, this woman sounds interesting. So let me do a little more research on her. And then I found out that she's, <laughs> she's uh, like running like this probably like kind of like a scam and like uh, promoting alternative medicine. Oh. Uh, and then there's uh, like, but all of this stuff is in Spanish. So that thing about like just going through all of that has uh, slowed me down. But. So you're sticking with that with that uh, target, as we say, the subject of the yeah. I, I submitted it to Susan, and she says, "Yeah, do it." It pro was probably something oh, that huh. needs to be <laughs> written, even though I guess typically, like for your first one, you're supposed to do something that's like not too controversial. Yes, for but, sure. Yeah, yeah. but uh, I stumble upon that by accident. It's quite a yeah, find. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 once you know, by the way, in this team, you know, th there's not like no rules about once you graduate what you have to work on. So it's a good way to just know how to edit Wikipedia, and then you can go and do any kind of article you're interested in. I do a lot of space things because that's my original background. Uh, so I, I I wrote an article on um, the first astronaut in space from my company. Uh, and then I wrote one on the first cat in space, first and only cat in space. Uh, you know, and Girl Skeptics doesn't really care about those things specifically, but. But also it yeah. looks good to have, if, if you're a GSOW editor, it looks good to have a track record of editing a wide variety of things so that you yeah, don't and, appear to yeah. be like hung up on, oh, this all this person does is just rail on alt med. Yeah, yeah, right. Right, but we do have people who are like come out of a medical background and so they're more interested in doing that kind of thing, frankly. Yep. Um, there are some editors who really engage in religious stuff. Uh, I, I have done it occasionally, but rarely. Um, there's one editor who is constantly writing articles on, uh, you know, biblical problems, like chapter by chapter. Um, yeah, and, you know, it's not even articles I knew existed or would have been looking at, but He'll either write articles or greatly expand articles, which are maybe written from, from one perspective, and he'll inject a little bit of skepticism into them, things like that. And then we have uh, we have editors who do translations, and that really helps too. One editor just goes whole hog, and he has probably written a hugely significant part of Africanus. Yeah. Right? Is that how you say the language from South Africans? Africa? That's Wyatt, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's amazing because he just takes the English version and translates it and publishes it. So, so every language version of inside of Wikipedia is different. It's uh, it's run by a different organization. It's got different rules. You know, the technology might be somewhat different too. So, you know, Susan trains people to use the English version, but you can go off and figure out the difference if you know another language. Sometimes there are minor differences. 
um, and and then work that way. You can write original articles there or translate the versions from other languages to that. And, and Wyatt does a lot of that. I, I know he must have done some huge percent because there weren't a lot of articles right in that encyclopedia compared to English to begin with. And it's like every other day he's got one published. Right. Desiree, if you find if you're looking for an article that went poof on Wikipedia, um, if you know the exact title, you can work backwards from that. Um, you'll probably just get a page initially that says this article has been deleted, but you'll be able still to view. I think you may have to click through a level and then you'll be able to view the history tab and then you're in. Doreen Virtue seems to have removed her whole page. What does that mean? Desire? Would it be on Wayback Machine, the older internet pages? This is Dora. Hi. Hi. Are you, are you talking about it was the Wikipedia article? Yeah. If it was a, any type of article, sometimes there's some things are on that Wayback Machine, which is internet archive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So sometimes yeah, it's... You know, yeah, that's a good that's a good question, Jeff. Have you ever checked is Wikipedia automatically way you know archived? I don't know whether the Wayback Machine covers Wikipedia. We certainly use the heck out of the Wayback Machine in our editing. Yes. Um, because it's a great way to preserve a source for posterity. Um, right. and, yeah, whenever, and I think Richard right. used it a lot in the psychic predictions project, right? To yes. To uh, to freeze it freeze a prediction in time before the, the alleged psychic could uh, come back and um, retch on it. it. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah, so we're, we're taught, we don't always do it, but we, you know, the, the proper way to add a citation on Wikipedia is not only to add the original article, but to archive it at that moment and add that too in the same. The citation has the original and the archive in the same citation. So that way, if the, if the original goes bye-bye for some reason, uh, it just switches over to the archive. So I don't know about this Doreen Virtue. And uh, so when you say seems to have removed her whole page, so it's unlikely that somebody can remove their own Wikipedia article. It, it could have been it, she, that she wasn't notable and there was a vote on it and it, it went bye bye for that reason. Uh, what happens is somebody has to put it up for deletion and then people get to vote. And it's voting based on not just, hey, I don't like it, goodbye. You have to give the reasons why it should stay or why it shouldn't stay. And then a consensus is reached and that's how it's decided if an article should continue to exist. Um, so we actually did have a psychic medium. Now, I don't wanna use her name because I'm not sure which one it was at this moment. Maybe Jeff remembers or Romero if they were following things. But she was one of the rare people who found her own page and then went to talk, which is a, every article has a talk page in Wikipedia. It's right next to the article name, you click talk. And you can see all the editors arguing about what should or shouldn't be on the page. Well, she found her own page and didn't, didn't like it because it was all about, you know, that she's a con artist, that she's anti-vax. And she started striking things out of it, which immediately got reverted and put them back. And then she said, I'm going to complain to Wikipedia. I'm going to sue them. But, you know, that goes nowhere because everything that was on there was quoting reliable sources saying that she was anti-vax and promoted anti-vax conspiracies and things like that. Um, yeah. Interesting case there. It sounds like this, this Doreen Virtue person profited from the removal of her Wikipedia page. Well, she went Christian. I think I, I found something. She went so Christian, you so she had to take it on. <laughs> <laughs> her page her page was deleted in september of 2018. that's been a minute that'd yeah. probably be so hard to can, bring back hold on ah. you can actually um i googled her in wikipedia and i found this so you can actually search to find um oh, nice what pages have been deleted if there's not a term and it looks like it was Ooh, deleted per discussion <laughs> okay, as, as I thought, that'd be That's interesting. Yeah. To, I wonder if you can follow up and see the discussion. I think you can actually click maybe the link. Yeah, none of, none of the AFD discussions ever get deleted okay. as far as I know. They get archived eventually, but I think they stick around for all time. Oh. Well, she saw the light, so she had to take it down. There you go. 
how these <laughs> things work. Sorry. She, she saw the light. <laughs> Jesus called me. Um. <laughs> I think I found her because she was linked on somebody else's page. Yeah, she has. she's mentioned on James Van Prague's mm -hmm. page by name, yeah. but she's no longer, her article no longer exists, so it's not a wiki link. Yeah. Yeah, so, so being, being um, notable enough uh, and, and that's a specific, there's a specific definition of that word in Wikipedia is important to regarding whether or not you can have a page. Um, so notability, if you, if you, this is a little trick, if you go to Wikipedia and type W in the search bar for Wikipedia, WP colon and a word, it'll, it'll start showing you results for articles on Wikipedia that are not actual regular articles, they're articles about how Wikipedia rules work. Right. So like if you type WP colon notability, you'll see all the pages come up about, do you mean for a person? Do you mean for a, a business? Do you mean for a sports figure? Do you mean for a scientist? There's separate pages on all those subjects. And like if you printed them out, they'd be thick enough to be a book. And, and there's all different rules for all of those things. And, and, and to be notable as a skeptic is one of the hardest, uh, you know, bars it's, it's one of the lowest the highest bars the highest bars yeah it's a low bar to be notable as a um let's say a soccer a person who plays soccer right if you come out in the field and kick a ball in one official event you get a page on wikipedia but you can be a skeptic who's talked at conferences all the place has several books and whatever no it's, you're not notable enough it, it, it's the truth it's a, it's a shame and, and it's the same for scientists um, and part of it, the explanation is it has to do with numbers, right? There are less soccer players or, you know, pro football players than there are you know, academic scientists. And if every academic scientist had a page, that would be ridiculous. So they make all these rules for academic scientists, your work, your papers have to be, you know, um, pointed, have to be uh, called out by other scientists in their, in their papers. You have to be on academic, uh, you know, you have to have awards, you have to have academic commissions. It, it's a long stretch. And if you're a skeptic, it's even harder because you don't really fall into any specific category like that. Right? You don't write scientific papers, right? You, 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 it's, it's, it's very difficult to be notable as a skeptic. And the same goes for an atheist activist, too. So uh, Seth Andrews and uh, Matt Delahunty, uh, you know, we, we, the real skeptics had something in writing their page, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and, but that was a hard sell, even though, you know, taking Seth Andrews as an example, he uh, had a huge following, written several books at the time, um, you know, videos all over the place, he's interviewed all over the place, and it wasn't enough. But you'd step out on a soccer field and kick a ball and you got a page. So to, to us, it doesn't seem fair. Did you, Damn, those jokes. Did you ever hear the story about Seth Andrews with uh, complaining to Susan? Jeff? Uh, no, I don't think I did. She's told it several times. Well, as I recollect, they were at the same conference and Susan was in the row in front of Seth. If people who don't know, Seth Andrews is the Thinking Atheist, uh, Thinking Atheist podcast. So, oh, I landed here. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Nice. Wait, what does that mean? Explain that. What does that mean? That's how you landed here. What, is, what does that mean? Moon, did you say that moon? Was that moon? You're, you're muted, I don't know. That's who I listened to for the last nine years. So how'd, and, you, how'd that land you here? Well, he had links to everything. And I thought, well, I better get active. I'm retired now, so. And he was the only person I ever listened to other than R and Raw. Uh -huh. Other than that, I just never took the time to check anything out, so. And so I found this <laughs> from his website. From his um, website. Oh, that's Yeah, that's from his website. Yeah. Um, and I support oh, him through okay. Patreon, Patreon, or whatever you pronounce that. Very cool. So, so, what was his story about Susan? Because well, I like him. Well, since you mentioned this, I'll, I'll have to say that I am going to be on The Thinking Atheist in a few weeks. So. Oh, you look, are? Okay. Look for that episode. I'll yeah. be looking for it. <laughs> so so the, the, it was in context of the Great Australian Psychic Prediction Project, which I mentioned 
Seth read my article on that and, and asked to talk to me. And, and then I got Richard Saunders involved who ran the project. So both of us are on the show being interviewed about that. So yeah, I was, I was really glad Seth took an interest in that because it's not a normal, you know, a normal subject for atheism, but that was really cool. So yeah, the story, so Seth is at the conference with Susan sitting in the row right behind her waiting for someone to talk. Susan's talking to someone else in the first in the row and they were, she was talking about editing Wikipedia. And I think she said something about, uh, oh yeah, there's a local windmill here, which is a historic building. So someone on her team wrote a Wikipedia article for it. And Seth said, a windmill has a Wikipedia article and I don't. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, because notability for a building is a lot less than for a person. That's the truth. But yeah, he, he was not happy about that because he, he had been in contact with Susan. Can I get a Wikipedia article? What's going on? And no, sorry, you're not notable. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll hope you are at some point. And then he hears that the windmill has one. <laughs> Pretty good. That's another interesting thing to do in Wikipedia. Like if you uh, look at things that are entries uh, where you, near you live, and there's like no pictures for those places, then you can take pictures and then right. upload them to Wikipedia. Yeah, so what people don't know about that usually is every photograph on Wikipedia comes from a place called Wikipedia, Wikimedia Commons. Wikimedia is the foundation that not only has Wikipedia under it, but um, Wiki University and Wiktionary, Wikipedia Dictionary essentially, uh, and there's a bunch of other things. But, but the photographs in any of the places need to be uploaded to Wikimedia Commons. And there are, are, are all sorts of rules about how to do that. But you, you can see how to, on any Wikipedia page, you can say upload photo, and that'll start the process for you. So you can in fact do that. And the thing is it has to be, there's all rules about photography, which is even more difficult than the notability requirements for subjects on Wikipedia. I've had photos I've uploaded, deleted, um, like, there's, a, there's, a, there's an open air sculpture garden and I took nice pictures of the sculptures in there. And I, no, in the US law, those are not public property to take a photo of. Uh, the owner of the sculpture, like, oh. you know, even some buildings apparently you can't because that's the owner of the architecture owns that. It's like, it's bizarre. And there's a whole page in Wikipedia describing this. Different countries have different rules about sort of things like that. Uh, so, so it's difficult, but, but, oh, and I, I once uploaded something. No, yeah, I got someone else who was, I was writing about to upload a photo of themselves and they put in Wikimedia Commons and therefore I could use it on the page. And it turns out that it was his wife's camera and the camera she bought from someone else. And in the metadata for, for the shot of the, of the picture, it had camera owner and it was not them. So that got deleted because you don't own this photo. And how ridiculous is that? But this, that's this, why you should always strip out the EXIF data. Mm -hmm. Now you do that and you get in trouble too. I did that. I uploaded, I went to Bethlehem for a meeting of the Skeptics Guide to the Universe. Uh, it was their a skeptical extravaganza hosted by George Robb. And Bethlehem, I took Pennsylvania? Yes. Yeah, you didn't know there was a Bethlehem, Pennsylvania? Yes, I knew that. Just clarifying. <laughs> Yes, there was a uh, there there was a picture I took of Bob, and I it, I had to zoom in on it, and so I put it into some photo editing thing, and that stripped out that data, and I did not know that. And when I uploaded it, then it got deleted on the basis, oh, this was a screen capture from somewhere, and you didn't say where it came from. Uh, it's like oh, can't win. It's I I I very much dislike the whole thing of photos. But it, it, it's great if you get can do it. And Susan has had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds because she's a photographer of her yep. photos updated, uploaded and put on all sorts of pages. And uh, that, that is a nice thing to do. If, if you do it without trouble, go with your own camera. You're sure it's your own camera and not borrowed from somebody with your name in the metadata. Take a photo of something they were allowed to take a picture of and you upload it. And then, yeah, you can put it on Wikipedia wherever it's appropriate. I, I should not show you the pages on the on the uh, Leaning Tower of Pisa page where my wife is pushing on the tower, pushing on. Because <laughs> yes, I did that. Nice. 
All right, folks, we probably ought to wrap this one up unless anybody has anything else for Rob. Hi, Wendell. I, I, I just had one question uh, yeah. about the psychic and medium stuff. Yes. And um, one of the things, because I'm a somewhat of a gamer, is that I see so much of that as just permeating everything. As so part much of, of what? So all the, just like, for example, Animal Crossing. It, it, for their new update, they had to bring back their psychic. Uh, little, Katarina. Yes, Katarina. <laughs> and I'm like, why? <laughs> and of course she has to, so, you know, you have to give her 10,000 bells so you can, uh, you know, get better friendship. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, a psychic <laughs> character in the game yeah it's a psychic character in the game and of course she has a little crystal ball and i'm like why why do they have to put all this stuff in there i mean i like her <laughs> so I'm many sorry. people like her <laughs> i mean everyone everybody loves her and i'm like okay i'm the wet blanket <laughs> yeah it, 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 it is a general, it is, a, I, I've gotten asked this, you know, is it okay, you know, I don't know. I mean, it just perpetuates it, and I mean, everything, yeah. in every yeah. one yeah. of these games. I, Do I you play Animal it. Crossing? Uh, I have, yes, I have two, okay. two Animal Crossing okay. games. Or I used to there's some games. villagers you should have that are very science and skeptically based that yeah. I like having. Uh, those are the ones I get. <laughs> <laughs> Aurora and Octavian are the yes. two. Yeah. Yeah. They will never leave my island. No, <laughs> they don't. Octavian's not leaving my island either. I'm just yes, like, he has. Uh, he has a space themed house. Like there's a Saturn V rocket, a satellite, and all this stuff in this octopus's house. And Aurora, well, she's a little penguin that'll walk around, and sometimes she has said stuff about, "I just like to look up at the vastness of the night sky and see all the stars." And I'm just like, "I love you. You're like me in character form. It's wonderful." <laughs> I'm just to me, it's just so much part of the whole culture that I think it's just really hard to combat it all. And yeah, I mean, this has been asked before skeptics and all sorts of subjects, like people who believe in ghosts. And you know, we we so gravitate like towards those things. I mean, yeah. like you look at fantasy yeah. novels. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, one, one would expect magic. people to understand the difference between reality and not, and unfortunately, some people don't. But Jeff, yeah. we should make a plug for next week about the book. Yeah, in case people want to join, because I'm halfway through and y'all need to read it. Yeah, I need to start it. I, I'm I'm behind the eight ball on this one, but yeah, I think you're Linda recommended the... this one. Um, yep. She's gone now, but yeah, I'll definitely give a plug. Uh, uh, yeah, next next week we're mm -hmm. we're talking about the book Charlatan by Pope Brock, uh, who is not an actual pontiff, historical or otherwise. Uh, that's just the author's given name is Pope, weirdly. Uh, but it's the story of um, oh, faith, help me. Um, I think the guy, the last, the guy's last name is Brinkley, and it basically, it's told in a narrative format. So it's you're getting, it almost feels like some of the stuff that I'm being told isn't really true because it's just like this, so and so does this, um, but it's really fascinating because it sort of goes into his history as this quack doctor that goes around um, transplanting goat testicles into people. <laughs> and how he and how he got away with this for so long didn't go to prison or anything when he got caught scamming people out of money and you really get an idea that medicine back at the turn of the you know 20th century like you could just go to a diploma mill and get a degree and say you were a doctor and nobody questioned it it was a different time a very different time but they yeah. also talk about yeah, and it's it's fascinating, like the stuff that they're talking about, even like the medical stuff I'm going through right now. <laughs> yeah. It's reminding me of, you know, these are because we didn't people didn't live long enough to know that there was cancer and these other things. So this is how bad science started <laughs> before we got to the peer review process. Yep. And if I'm not mistaken, the the uh, this book subject is kind of the person who established the uh, the archetypal moves to Mexico and starts a practice there to get around mm. the walls closing in on them in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and so I, think, 
I just looked it up on Wikipedia and there is no article on either the book or Pope Rock, but there is about the guy you're talking about, John R. Brinkley. Man, mm -hmm. that's one. Yeah. yeah. yeah so, he, he was, I think he was born here in North Carolina ooh, um, in Beta. Yeah, in Beta, which is in Jackson County, which is maybe an hour ish north of Silva, that area. So, like mountain crazy stuff. <laughs> At the height of yeah. his career, he had amassed millions of dollars, but he died penniless as a result of the large numbers of malpractice, wrongful deaths, and fraud suits brought against him. Oh, mm -hmm. man. And his middle name is Romulus, which I thought was just so wow. fascinating. Oh. <laughs> <That's epic. laughs> yes. No, really? Oh, yes. he changed it. He changed it. Wikipedia says John Romulus Brinkley, later John Richard Brinkley. Yeah. Well, Richard was his father's last name or middle name. And I forget why his mom gave him, oh, he, she gave him Romulus because of the twins. So mm -hmm. there's, yeah, yeah. Wow. She's, okay. she's a little woo-woo. She didn't leave him in the care of wolves? No, she, she well, she sort of, I mean, she died when he was five, so, you know. Yeah. Okay, maybe so. Wow, yeah. so it's actually subtitled, Charles, America's Most Dangerous Huckster. Wow. Oh, yeah, that covers some territory. <laughs> that yeah. was a Linda recommendation. I'm I'm really excited to get into it. And also speaking of Linda, for anybody who didn't join um two weekends ago, the Monterey Skeptic Camp uh from Monterey Skeptics, Linda gave a fantastic talk uh during during that about uh attachment therapy. Um it is hard to to watch. But um, the videos yeah. that she shows, I yeah. know that uh, yeah. Faith and Ramiro were uh, were both there. As was Eric. Boys too. Yeah, I can't uh, believe yeah. that was a thing. I I guess it still is a thing. It is still a thing. It is still like, a thing. Because there is there is reactive attachment disorder. Yeah, yeah. I was, um, I was googling and, all that while I was yeah. watching. But By the way, attachment therapy is not a real therapy. If you haven't figured that uh, out yet. It's basically let's abuse your child into loving yeah, you because they've yeah. had, well, you know that in like um, Eastern European orphanages, babies tend to just sit in cribs all the time or places where there's just too many children to take care of and you're short staffed. Well, we know that if you don't nurture a child while they're crying, that they start to learn that, well, I'm just going to sit here and cry. I, nobody's going to come feed me. Nobody's going to change my diaper. So they kind of develop maladaptive behavior towards that and this attachment therapy is supposed to help the child now bond with their adoptive parent or other relative that's taking care of them when the child has grown up learning that there's no reliable adult here to comfort me when I'm in pain so they don't develop those attachments and this is a response of I'm going to physically hold you down and tell you to like yell in your face to tell you to love me I've done everything for you kind of thing so and parents don't parents are desperate and these people are preying upon them when and there's really no good way to to tr to really deal with this in a therapeutic setting outside of um cognitive behavioral therapy CBT or dialectal behavior therapy and so yeah one of the videos she showed, or maybe I found this after because I was looking into a little bit of this after show talk. I don't remember, was the person was like held down and basically crushed or suffocated to death? Yes, the parent uh, was. Um, no, oh. the case, the one you're talking about is where they did rebirthing techniques. So what they'll do is they'll take the, they'll take, um, the child's probably about a teenager, 10 years old. And what they'll do is they'll rebirth them. So they'll wrap them up tightly in blankets to simulate as if they were coming through their mother's womb to, to, re, to redo the birthing experience. And what ends up happening is they suffocate. Like this girl was suffocated during the process. Like she was telling them she couldn't breathe and she was just being wrapped up in this blanket with adults laying on top of her. And I, they were convicted of homicide charges, but only served a little bit of time and they were released like this. And this happened, this little... This girl was born in Lincolnton, North Carolina, I think. And this all happened in Durham. And these social workers came from like Colorado. And so Wikipedia article says at least six documented child fatal fatalities. Mm -hmm. 
Well, uh, good way on good that on me note. for bringing it down. <laughs> That's okay. Next week we'll be talking about goat testicles. That's right. Oh. And who doesn't like to talk about goat testicles and how they are cure alls? <laughs> yes. All right, yeah. folks. Can, can, can they cure COVID? I want to know if they can cure COVID. Oh, I'm I'm well, sure. I mean, probably. well, it could. Pro I mean, they were supposed to cure virility and like make you like make. So maybe this could be a cure well, for long COVID. That I makes sense. Know. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Sounds like they don't do a lot of good for the goat. <laughs> <laughs> no, he had he had a supply chain issue at one point, and <laughs> yeah, I've been taking I've been taking very long walks, and so I'm walking around Shelly Lake, and I'm listening about somebody being cut open and having a test transplanted in them and there's like lovely people walking past me <laughs> wait you don't use earphones yeah, you, i do use earphones i do use earphones but it's it it's fun just walking around it's, and realizing you're listening to something something inappropriate nobody knows <laughs> what's going on yeah you're laughing your head off and <laughs> goat testicles and dr brinkley and yes. bigamy like there's uh, this is just so fascinating like while I'm listening to it, I don't because of how he's narrating it. Because I'm listening to it on Audible, it doesn't seem like yeah. this is a real story. Like I want to fact check all of this. Stuff. <laughs> <laughs> like, this isn't true. Can't be. Uh, this, Sorry, this pause and fact check. Like who had like two hundred and seventy some dollars during the Great Depression to get some goat testicles like slapped in? Wow! Did you do the, the, the go to the site that does uh, you know? Uh, uh, the current value of money when you give a date can can oh I, my God. I haven't checked that but wikipedia i think when it was last updated it was saying something like that was the equivalent of nine or ten thousand dollars oh my god which could buy you like two houses yeah. back then. <laughs> or three i don't know yeah well wow all right well we'll find out all about that next week during triangle mm -hmm. skeptics culture club and i hope that i'll see all of you back here then all right yeah. All right. Take care. Thanks Rob, for having me. Rob, everybody stay safe. Thanks, everybody. Yes. Rob. Yes. Thank you so I much, Rob. Rob. Really appreciate no, no, you being Rob, so generous with you your time. Did you guys discuss, yes. or I came late. Did you guys discuss, discuss cardology? Do I? Do I? Do I? Do I, do I, do I cardology. I don't know what that is. No. Uh, <laughs> I've got an associate. No. That her newest passion is cardology. And it. <laughs>
I can't hold it back. 